For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? You may be seated. I want to leave off right there, and I'm just going to use verse number 8, where uh, Paul asked King Agrippa, why would it be thought something incredible with you that God would raise the dead? And uh, what I want to do is I want to entitle my message today, Nothing is Incredible with God. Nothing is incredible with God. Jesus said one time, he said, I have all power in heaven and in earth. He said to us, he said, you can do nothing without me. Uh, the the uh, things that you and I probably would have power to do may be limitless if our prayer life and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life was where it ought to be. It's amazing that way that how God could use every one of us. And then if we were in a right relationship, when God did use us to do one of the things, we would turn around and we would say, all the glory goes to God because nothing's incredible with Him. You all believe that God can do all things? Yes. I do. I always like to end it with this. There's one thing He cannot do. He cannot lie. And uh, that's why I appreciated our Sunday school lesson this morning. It says, does absolute truth exist? And it does. It's in the Word of God. And I'm, I'm thankful for the Word of God today. Amen. So today, we just simply, I want to touch on a few of the things in Scripture that we're very familiar with. And I want to, uh, as we come here a week or so before Christmas, week and a half, before Christmas, we're thinking about the incredible birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to deal with that first and foremost as soon as we have prayer. Let's do that right now. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, thanking you again for the privilege of allowing us to be in the house of God today. We know that there's folks, a lot of them, uh, to the north of us today that aren't going to be able to gather for their worship service, their snow down or snow in our eyes or something. Uh, Lord, we're just thankful that you've allowed us uh, to be able to come to this little house of worship today. Lift up the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the songs that have been sung. Father, we noticed that those old songs were written uh, 150 or more years ago, some of them over 200 years ago, and yet they still hold special place in all of our hearts, and we thank you for those songs, and I'm thankful for the special that Ralph and Jeremy sang today. God, it gives us hope that uh, we will be in that place one of these days where there will be no more tears, no more heartache, no more sorrow, no more pain, none of the, the former things will be allowed to enter into that place. Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope that we have as a child of God. Now, Father, as we think about things that are not incredible with you, I pray that you'd anoint uh, the message today, uh, allow my tongue to say that which would honor and glorify you. And Heavenly Father, give me wisdom to know when to not say something as well. And, and I realize just, uh, Father, that I'm, I'm even, I may be 60 years old, but I'm still learning when there's times that I ought to Watch my tongue. And so, Father, I pray you help me to do everything I can today in this message. To uplift and honor the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you have your will in your way? Thankful for each one who's here today. Thank you, Father, for those that have been away from us for a while and bringing them back safe to us. We ask God that we would leave this place with a song in our heart today, with joy and encouragement. And, Father, we pray that if there's anyone here today who's not saved, they've never received Jesus as their Savior. May they see today that salvation is something that is not incredible with God. He can easily save them. Have you willing your way to remain in the service? Well, thank you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I told you I was going to start out talking about the birth of Christ because here we are a week and a half from, from uh, Christmas. And it wasn't one of the things that I was going to bring up this morning. But let's just think about that a little bit. I don't know where I heard this at, if it was... If it was here, but it was just recently, I was listening to somebody, and they seemed to think that history tells that Mary was about 13 years old when Jesus was born. Now, I don't know of anything that tells us that, and uh, it seems mighty young to me. But the whole point of the matter is, is that Mary, regardless of what age she was, she was a virgin. She had never been with a man. She did not know man whatsoever. Her and Joseph were a spouse to one another. Their relationship was pure. Uh, it was uh, a one that was honoring to God. And yet, one night, the Holy Ghost, or excuse me, the, the, the angel, the archangel, comes into the very presence of Mary. 
and mentions to her, tells her that she is highly favored, that she is well chosen of God. The, only God will be able to let us know why exactly it was that He chose this little girl, but He did. And He told her that the Holy Ghost would come upon her and would implant her, if you would, with the seed of God's child. And so she had to allow Joseph to know this. Uh, he thought to privately put her away, to uh, somewhat divorce her and get out of the deal. No telling. The rest of their lives, Joseph apparently died long before Mary did, but both of them, the rest of their lives, there were people that mocked them and made fun of them and talked about them when they walked down the street, that they were the ones that had a child out of wedlock when they actually did. And there were people that never would believe that. But I believe that today, I believe that this was God's baby, don't you? Amen. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. I believe that God so loved the world enough that He gave that Son for you and I so that we can have everlasting life if we believe upon Him and trust His finished work on the cross of Calvary. But you know what? That little baby was implanted within her and at the appropriate time, uh, just as prophecy would give it, it told where, where He would be born. Uh, it, was, it was foretold that He would be a Nazarite or a Nazarene. Uh, they lived in Nazareth. Uh, uh, it, it told so many things. So if God can do something like that, our question to a lost and <clears throat> died <clears throat> an unbelieving world today, if God could do something like that, why would you think that there was anything that was too out of reach for God to do? Nothing is incredible with God. Uh, Jesus told his parents, uh, he was 12 years old, and uh, they went up to uh, Jerusalem, and, and on the way back, two days into their journey, they discovered that he was no longer with them, and they turned around and they went back and they found him in uh, the temple uh, debating with the scribes there and teaching and uh, they called him out and when he came out they said uh, why have you done this you know we, we were terrified we were wondering where you were at and he said I must be about my father's business and that's all that Jesus ever did he was always about his father's business I was listening to some probably false teacher just recently somebody who doesn't have a good grasp on God's word and and it told about, uh, or they asked the questions, you know, did he say something under his breath when as a carpenter he hit his thumb with a hammer? And uh, did he have a girlfriend on the side? And, and idiotic questions like that. Jesus said he came to be about his father's business. And that's what he spent 33 and a half years doing, was taking care of the plan of salvation and teaching you and I how that we can live a godly and sober, separated life for him. Amen. And so why would it be thought anything incredible with God that since he was able to allow a virgin to bring forth the Son of God, why would anything else be out of his reach? Let's th uh, think about, just very briefly, about creation. Uh, creation is one of those things that is one reason why we have private schools today, because public schools are not allowed to teach creation. Uh, they teach, uh, give me the word. <laughs> Evolution. I didn't start with the E. I just went blank there. Uh, but they, they teach evolution. And uh, that is that they believe that there was a, an explosion of some kind. I was just watching a deal recently uh, about a, a, a comet uh, that went screeching by the earth. And people were able to predict that 20 years before. And uh, people think that that is something that is still being propelled by the great explosion that have happened uh, jillions of years ago. Now I'm going to tell you, and I will tell you when something is my personal opinion. I believe we can base it on Scripture if we go back in history and we date things and time them. The world, I believe, the earth as we know it, is no more than six or 7,000 years old. So when you hear somebody say millions of years ago, you know immediately, you don't know if they're a Christian or not, they're not a Bible-believing Christian. Because the scripture does not teach about millions of years ago. And listen, there was a time when I was one of them that said, hey, listen, who says that a day uh, was a 24-hour period when God was creating the earth and doing all those things? Well, if you go back and study, and you study the Hebrew word for day, it's 24 hours is what it was. God did all this in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. 
And he took care of everything that you and I would ever need. I saw a politician's ad yesterday. His number one agenda is to get us back on track to save this world. What a waste of air. What a waste of time. Uh, they say, oh, you know, the, the, the ice uh, cap is melting and the oceans are coming up. Listen, God knows all about this. It's in God's plan. Don't let these things bother you and keep you up of the night. God never meant for this world to last forever. This world, one of these days, He is going to renovate it with fire, by fire. He promised in Genesis it would never, ever be flooded again, ever. And so I know those of you in the city of Seven Valleys, in the springtime, you start wondering, did he keep his word or not? Because downtown Cassville is always underwater. But listen, I want to promise you something. God said that this world would never flood again. But he did say it would be burned up with unquenchable fire. So God never expected it to last forever. It is not our job to save this world. Should we do our part in being kind to what God has given us? Yeah. Yes, or this morning we come through Flat Creek down there across the same bridge we've went around, across 100,000 times since I've been pastoring here. Somebody pulled up since Wednesday night and dumped all their trash. I mean a whole pickup load right by the creek. That kind of irks me. And let me tell you another one of my little pet peeves. You all are going to think that I'm Mother Earth and one of these green fun people. I'm not. At work where I work, we have a trash can, and touching it is a recycle bin for water bottles. People throw their water bottles in the trash can. And I'm like, do you know how long it's going to take for that to break down? And our children may have to drink that water, and our grandchildren, one, I'm just kind of silly about that. But I figure we ought to recycle what we can recycle. You don't have to be crazy about it. But listen, God gave us a beautiful earth. Why don't we take care of it the best that we can? He's going to destroy it one of these days. You know why? This is my Father's world. This is my Father. It don't belong to me. It is my Father's world, and He'll do what He wants to. Well, I kind of got off there just a little bit, didn't I? I know some of you are under your breath praying for your pastor right now. Your God help him. He, he's on the verge of becoming a liberal. Be help him, Lord. <laughs> Exodus 20, verse 11 says that, well, let me ask you. Those of you who live in, in a nice home and, and you have a nice yard and everything, do you like going out and picking up the beer bottles and beer cans and pop cans out of your yard and the cigarette butts? And everything. No, I wish people just take it and throw away in their trash. I, I get a little aggravated about it. Exodus 20, verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. There is no such thing as a fish crawling up out of the, the ocean and becoming a coyote later on. Amen? Amen. When he made a fish, he made a fish. <clears throat> all these... Uh, Dog food commercials. Do you know how much people make on dog food a year? Billions and billions of money, of dollars, is made on uh, these. And they have these commercials where every dog used to be a wolf. No, he didn't. He used to be a dog. He may have been wild, but there were wolves and there were dogs. Psalm 19, verse number 1. Tell you that, that? Is that what you said? Oh, they're related. They're related. Yeah. Yeah. Me and my wife are related, but sometimes you can't tell it. <laughs> Psalms 19 and verse number 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. You know, about a, a week and a half ago, we've got this new little puppy. Got it at a rescue place in Crane. Uh, we've been wanting one. We had a, a black lab. And we had a female dog that had been dumped at our place several years ago. And, and one day she ch chased Beth down the driveway as Beth went to work. It was the last time we ever saw her. We've never found her carcass, nothing. We don't know what happened to her. And that black lab, I'm telling you, that's his best buddy. They traveled all over that country every day. And when, he, when she went missing, he's been losing weight. He's been mourning. You all know dogs do things like that. Well, we've been wanting to find him another friend. Well, this one is a black uh, the mama was a lab and a pit bull, and I don't find any lab in him at all. He's, he just acts like a pit bull. Beautiful, beautiful puppy. And uh, him and that lab have become best friends, and we'll watch out the window as they wrestle and roll around and play. It's so much fun. But uh, back to Psalms 19 and verse number 1. 
about a week and a half ago, I, the, the little one, Beth, named him Buddy. So I said, hey, Buddy, let's go out in the field and see if we see seen deer. So we took a little track down to my timber out there, and, and I was laying on the hillside that was facing the west, and it was right before sundown. I need to show you on my phone sometime. I started taking pictures of the sunset. Listen, if you can look at the sunset and not realize that there is a God, I'm telling you, the word there says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Hannah, when she was a little big girl, she saw one of those beautiful sunsets and she said there's a picture that no artist could paint. She was just a little big girl, but she said only God can do something like that. And isn't it wonderful? If you don't have a television, you can watch the clouds and be entertained. Amen? I'm telling you, God has just, he's just put on a show for us and it, it don't cost him nothing. You and I get to enjoy the things that look at them, the beauty of the earth. This last June, our family took a cruise. I don't know if I'll ever do it again or not. But there we were out in the middle of that beautiful ocean. You couldn't see land for two days. It was beautiful. And to think that God made all of that. Nothing is incredible with God. Amen? Amen. All right, let's talk about how incredible is God's protection of you and I. I know some of you have probably had that, uh, that uh, t instance in your life where you uh, heard about a terrible accident and you backed up and you realized that if you hadn't got stuck, a stop, stuck at a stop line or if somebody hadn't cut you off in traffic, it would, the timing would have been perfect. You'd have been right there. You weren't happy about it at the time, but God protected you. Hannah and I had a daddy-daughter date. Our last one, before she gets married this coming Saturday, we had one Friday night, and we went downtown Springfield, and, and uh, I'm, uh, we had a very, very, very nice steak dinner down there, a very nice atmosphere. We had a lot of fun. We talked and had a great time. We found our way out of downtown, and I told her, I said, all I'm going to do is I'm going to watch the direction we're going because I know we're going to come to a major street. We came to Kansas Expressway. I, I turned right, and I said, okay, we're going north. We're either going to end up at Chestnut or I-44. Well, we ended up Chestnut. This was about 8.30 or so. Found out yesterday that not far from that intersection, there was a fatal shooting not long after we were there. You know, and you just say, God, thank you for protecting yes. us. Yes. We were downtown Springfield. I don't know how long it's been since you all been. I mean, when I say downtown, I mean downtown. And listen, I was kind of watching the people that were walking around down there. I, I thank God for his protection of me. The Bible says in Psalm 34, verse 7, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Do you all believe that? I don't know if God's Word ever talks about so-called guardian angel, but if it is, that's the closest thing to it right there. It says he encamps around about those who know him and love him, and he protects them. Sometimes when you feel that you're all by yourself, you're lonely, listen, God has got somebody watching over you. And, and maybe He Himself. I love this story. And I, I actually preached about it this summer over in 2 Kings when I spent so many Sundays over there on the Watch This series that I preached. There's a great story about Elijah over there. And he's got a young man with him. And old Elijah, nighttime comes and he lays down and he's going to go to sleep. Well, the young boy, he's worried to death because all he can hear, I think is, I think it was the Samaritans or Samarians or somebody that were, uh, he was worried that they were going to come in and attack him. And Elisha said in, in 2 Kings 6, 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and I love this, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. Then it wasn't the, the horses and chariots of the enemy. It was the horses and chariots of God. Amen. That's how important that you and I are to God. He will protect you. It's, it's not a foolish thing to say, God, please protect me. It's not like the doubting that he's going to. Just allow God to know that you, you fully uh, trust him to watch over you and keep you from all harm and danger. Listen, this life is full of uncertainties, amen? amen? From day to day, there are things that come along. And uh, Psalm 91, verse 4 says this, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. 
His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Now I want to back up on that part. And here's the whole reason I shared that verse with you. It says his truth shall be your shield and buckler. What is his truth? We just studied it in Sunday school. It's the word of God. Amen. Listen, when you are feeling encamped around about by the enemy, the truth of God's word will be your shield and buckler. It will be your protection. So, it's nothing incredible with God that He created the world and everything in it in six days. And then on the seventh, He rested. It's nothing incredible with God that He can protect you and I. It's nothing incredible that He can deliver His children. Exodus 14 over there. Uh, the Bible talks about how Moses has finally gotten the okay. Basically, he told Pharaoh, we're leaving. And all the children of Israel packed up. The Egyptians gave them their gold and stuff. It was almost like, here's my stuff. Get out before any more harm comes to us. Moses let them out. They come to the Red Sea. About the time they get there, old Pharaoh gets to thinking about it. Now, the Scripture says that God hardened his heart. And it says that he got to thinking about it, and he said, let's go get them. And he loaded up all of his chariots and his horses, and they went after him. And the Bible says in Exodus 14, verse 21, and when the Egyptians came up on him, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Now, I'm telling you what, I'd like to have been there. I'd like to have been there. But you know what? I hear these dingling scientists today that they have come up with a little glass thing, an enclosure with water in it, and they take a fan and blow it in there seeing how much of a wind it took. Listen, this was the hand of God. Yeah. Man can't do anything like that. And they doubt and they doubt. They're always questioning the things of God. Daniel chapter 3. The Bible says that... Uh, there were three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, one of our favorite children's stories, and yet it's a great adult story. Amen? Amen. God's Word says that they refused to bow down when they heard the musical instruments play. And uh, they were warned about it. Finally, they were taken before Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, now, just to make sure you understand, if you don't bow down, we're going to heat the, the, this oven up, and you're going to be thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. And they said, well, live forever, O king, but we cannot do it. And our God will either deliver us from it, and if he doesn't, we'll go to be to heaven. Go to be in heaven. By the way, on Facebook one day this week, there was a lady from a church. By the way, Sheila, while you're listening to this, you can believe this one, okay? I'm going to tell you a story you believe, all right? My first real pastorate, we had a, a lady and her husband had a little baby. He was born 12 and a half weeks early. Two and a half pounds, I think, is what he weighed. He was in the uh, ICU for two months, two and a half months. They finally got him nursed, brought him home, and he, she was feeding him. He was in his high chair. She was feeding him. The phone rang. She turned around, answered the phone, and turned around, and her baby was dead. Yeah. Oh. With that sudden infant, you know, uh, sit. And she couldn't, he was already blue. I mean, that's just how quick it all happened after all they'd been through. And this week, as she reminded us that that little boy would have been 30 this last week. I mean, I just don't know how t where time went. But I wrote on there, I said, you know, I think of that day often. But I said, I'm kind of like King David. I can't bring him back, but I can go to be with him. And then I wrote in parentheses, that is not KJV, that's KHV. I never thought about that before in Kevin Hilton's version <laughs> So what I've just quoted to you, this story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it isn't necessarily word for word. It's KHV. But listen to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, well, I've got no other choice. And he was mad. The Bible says he was mad. And they heated that old furnace up seven times hotter than it was meant to be heated, the Scripture says. They threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in there. And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar asked one of his counselors, how many did we throw in? He said three. And he goes, well, I see four. And a four in there, and the fourth one is likened to the Son of Man or the Son of God. Listen, it's not an incredible thing that God would deliver His children from danger. It says in verse 28, Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent His angel and delivered His servants 
that trusted in Him. That's what you and I've got to do. Amen? Amen. Trust in Him. Amen. Now, another great story that we all know from the, from the book of Daniel, chapter number 6. Oh, Daniel, he's been praying in his house every day. And the guys that are upset about him being elevated in position, they come up with a little trick. They have old King Darius sign a decree uh, that nobody is to ask of any other deity except for him for a certain amount of period of time, 30 days, I think it was. He thought it was a great idea, and uh, he signed it, and they went down and just waited outside Daniel's house. He got home from work, threw his windows all open, got down and faced Jerusalem, uh, the east, and he prayed just as he had aforetime. Nothing changed him about that. The Bible says that uh, he was thrown into the lion's den. And Daniel said in 622, My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. What a great thing. Isn't it incredible? I know you say, well, we live thousands of years later and things were different back then. Listen, Daniel belonged to God. And if you're saved today, you belong to God. Yeah. And God wants to protect you. He wants you to trust Him. Now, here's one that makes us scratch our head sometimes. What about physical healing? Can God, is anything incredible with God to physically heal somebody <laughs> of, a, of an ailment that they have? Here's one that I tell all the time. It's because it sticks out in my mind. Mark Hemphill is a kid I graduated with. He's the same age as I am. He was a, uh, one, and still is, a wonderful singer. Man, he would sing at church, and I mean, he'd just almost melt you. He had just a crooner's voice. Beautiful. Mark started getting sick. They got him to the doctor. They found out that there was a cancerous tumor wrapped around the main aorta of his heart. They started doing chemo, they did radiation, they did all the tests. One Saturday, Mark, after all those tests, he just looked like he was bleached out. He was just white. Weak, lost weight. He came down to the altar and people of the church gathered around about him. He went back to the doctor the next week to decide uh, what the next step was going to be. What kind of surgery would it take? What kind of treatment? How, how long do I have? He went back and they ran x-ray after x-ray and they came back and they said we can't find that tumor it's gone listen that doesn't happen all the time but I want you to know it is nothing incredible with God for him to touch somebody's body and heal them I don't have it with me I took it down on the front pew there the reason we publish our prayer request list is for you and I to take them home and put it on your refrigerator, put it in your Bible, put it next to your bed, put it on your coffee table, somewhere to be reminding of you, you that these are people that have asked us to pray for them. Right now, things may be pretty good with you. Your health's good, your finances are okay, family's doing fine, everything's going good. Listen, you may be on the list next week. It may be a doctor this week that will tell you something. And I hope it's not me, but I'll say this. I've got a mold that's growing right here. And I've had it for about a year. It just suddenly showed up. It is so big now, it's rubbing against my shirt. And, uh, and it's, it's not out of, you know, it's round, but it's growing exponentially fast. I'm going to go have it cut off this week. I'd hate for the doctor to say, you know, this is worse than just a mold. Amen? Amen. I'd hate for that to happen. But it could be me next week that's on that prayer request list. We've been, you know, we've prayed for uh, Jim and, and his family during the time we lost his dad. We've got Roger, Ruthie. I could go around the room. There's people in this building today that need our prayers. It's nothing incredible with God to touch somebody's body, okay? So the Word of God says in Matthew 4, 24, And they brought unto him all sick that were taken with divers diseases, that means different diseases, and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were a lunatic, and those that had the palsy, listen, and he healed them. Every one of those ailments, it said some of them were mental. Some of them were simply sick. Some of them were lunatic out of their mind. It didn't matter. Whatever they brought to him, he healed it. Don't think it's anything incredible with God for him to heal a body. Now I'm going to move right along and get close. Let's go from physical healing to spiritual healing. I hope nobody here doubts today that God can spiritually heal you. 
Amen. I'm glad I was spiritually healed. There's times when I wonder if I'm still sick just a little bit. But listen, He healed me. You see, God's Word says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible tells us that before we are saved, we are in darkness. But you know what He does when He heals us uh, spiritually? We go from darkness to light. Amen. We go from deadness to life. We pass from death unto life. That's what happens when He heals us. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9 says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be healed. Some people think you've got to do backflips. Some think you've got to see lightning, that you have to hear an audible voice. God's Word says, if you'll confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, thou shalt be saved. Yeah. Hell is going to be full of so many people that never ever heard the good news of how simple salvation was. And see, the great thing about it is you're not just quoting something. And it's not believing something for a couple of minutes while you're being witness to. It's something that changes your life. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Now I'm going to talk about promises. And then I'm going to close. So Ralph and Sharon, if you want to come and get ready with an invitation. We've talked about creation. Protection of the individual, deliverance of the believer, physical healing, spiritual healing. Every one of those comes with a promise that if you'll just simply trust Him. Even back in the deliverance, what about Elisha? How come he was able to lay down when the enemy was camped around the outside of him there? It's because he trusted the Lord. I want to say to you today, my friend, that there is nothing incredible with God that He will keep His promises. Amen. He will keep His word. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, He said, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Over the book of Hebrews, and I'm sorry I can't tell you chapter and verse, I should know it, but the word of God over there promises that He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, ever. Over in John, St. John 14, Jesus said this, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is a promise. He said, I will come back and get you and take you to where I am. He said there will be a mansion over there. He didn't say a cabin in the corner of glory land. He said there will be a mansion over there for you. It's a place that's being prepared. That is a promise from God. Why would anybody think that the promises of God are incredible? I'll tell you what, my friend, we serve an incredible God. Amen. And I hope that if you don't know Him today, that you'll come to know Him very, very soon. And if you do know Him, I hope that you'll leave today saying, My God is great. I'm glad I know Jesus as my Savior. I'm glad my name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm glad that my sins have been cast as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered against me ever again. I'm glad that, that I'm on my way to heaven. Because all of those things are promises from God's Word. Let's stand and have a verse of invitation. It's 347, 347.
don't know of anything about weather that might hinder that tonight or not. Uh, if so, the deacons will let us know. All right. Uh, and then you're going to stay, Debbie, you say, right afterwards and with all the kids, okay? All right. Brother Norm, it is really good to have you and your family back with us. Would you please dismiss us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're very grateful to be back in your house with your people, Father, and hear your word. Father, we just pray, Lord, that we would be all that you want us to be, Father, and know that there is nothing that you cannot do, cannot fix, cannot take care of, cannot heal. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you are always there. You never sleep and never on vacation, Father. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you'll be with each and every family here. Go with us on our way home and bring us back to you one time. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.